I wasn't supposed to stop at any 24-hour diners. The only people at diners in the middle of the night are people you want to stay clear of. My boss, Lenny, said to me when I first started driving trucks. You stay clear of those kinds of nocturnal diners off the highway. You're better off pulling the rig over to the side of the road and taking a nice nap. And if you're hungry, you wait until the sun is up and it's time for breakfast. Daytime diners and nighttime diners are two very different things, boy. I thought Lenny was superstitious then, and I still think that now, but I stuck to that advice for the past six months anyway. That man has been driving big trucks for decades, so I assume that he knows best because he's been doing something right. But man, my stomach is growling at me to the point that it's starting to hurt. I haven't eaten in almost 48 hours, thanks to some traffic that delayed my shipment. If I don't put some food into my belly soon, I'll probably pass out at the wheel, and that wouldn't be good for anyone. Lenny will understand, or I just won't tell him that I had to ignore his advice this one time. I climb out of my rig and look around at the mostly empty lot outside of the diner. It's easy to see things under the glow of the full moon overhead. There are a couple of other trailer trucks off to the side. Their drivers are undoubtedly either inside the diner or probably getting some much deserved rest inside of their cabs. That sounds good to me. Once I get some food in my growling belly, I'll catch some shut eye in my own truck. It's surprising how you can find ways to make your driver's seat very comfortable after spending so much time in it. That's the thing about traveling all over the country in the truck. It can take you to all kinds of different places. And most places are in the middle of nowhere where there seems to be more wildlife than human life. At first glance, that diner felt like it was a small shred of civilization in the middle of wilderness. Only the distant sound of the stray car on the highway reminds me that there's other people around besides the people that have come to the diner. I walk toward the small building and glance at the dimly lit sign on the roof. It proudly displays how it is open 24 hours a day. I step inside to see if a place like this is as bad as Lenny led me to believe. It's a very retro and circular space with black and white tiled floors. And I immediately feel like I'm being transported to the 1950s, which is probably when the place first opened. There's something charming about it, but at the same time, it's also a little off-putting to suddenly be in a completely different time period. There are only three other customers in the diner, spread out across the restaurant booths. There's a couple giggling nearby that I notice first. They're young and pale, with greasy hair poking out from their hooded sweatshirts. They look like they haven't showered in days, but who am I to judge? Neither have I. They laugh and snort a little too loudly when I catch a glimpse of their puffy red eyes. It's pretty obvious that they are high on something. They're definitely having a very good night. A little too good. The only other customer is a man sitting in the corner booth by himself. His features are hard to see through his mane of long black hair that drapes down to a thick beard covering most of his face. He's completely focused on the five plates in front of him. There are parts of burgers and sandwiches that are in various states of consumption. It's like he couldn't decide what to eat or when, so just decided to have everything at once. While the few people in the diner seem a little strange, I don't see why Lenny was making such a fuss about avoiding them. Most places open that late at night had peculiar people, and the diner was no exception. I make myself comfortable at one of the booths, a few tables away from each of the other occupants. It's just nice to have some space to stretch outside of my truck. The waiter that comes over is an old, balding man that looks like he would rather be anywhere else. I can't really blame him. Working at a restaurant at two in the morning isn't anyone's ideal job. As far as I'm concerned, he can be as grouchy as he wants. The name tag over his heart simply reads, Ted. Can I get you something? He asks with very little interest. I glance down at the menu they have on the placemat. There aren't many options, and it's probably not a five-star meal, but my stomach doesn't care, as far as it's concerned. 
It just wants any kind of sustenance. I do see something that catches my eye. How's the bacon cheeseburger? The old man just glares at me like he doesn't like me bothering him. He doesn't make conversation or even try to answer my question. Is that what you want? He's not giving me much choice, and I would rather just order so he'll leave me alone. Sure, I'll have that and a side of fries. The waiter nods and walks away, grumbling something to himself. It's hard to hear, but it probably wasn't anything nice. The burly bearded man, his mouth biting into the third burger on his plate, frantically waves the waiter over. If I thought the old man looked annoyed with me, he looked absolutely done with that customer. Still, he did his job and went over to tend to him. When the bearded man in the corner booth spoke, his voice was deep and gravelly. It was hard to make out what he was saying through all the food stuffed in his mouth. What else have you got? Everything we have is on the menu, sir. Bye. Give me three more burgers. Make sure they're hearty. Ted, the waiter, does as he is asked, but still looks sick of the whole thing as he makes his way to the kitchen. I still can't blame him for being unenthusiastic about a job like that, especially at a time like that too. It has to be a rough shift to work. I make eye contact with the man in the corner booth. Something about the frantic look in his eyes unsettles me. For someone that's eating a whole menu in the middle of the night, he looks very excited and very full of energy. The couple in the room, still giggling among themselves, stumble out of the diner, leaving some cash on the table for Ted to take. A part of me worries that they shouldn't be driving in whatever condition they're in, but that's not my problem. I spent every hour of every day worrying about my own driving and my own vehicle. I can't worry about other drivers. Now it's just me, Ted, and the man gouging himself in the corner. Nice night, I say awkwardly, twiddling my thumbs. The man grins at me and some food falls from his lips when he does. He looks out the window and seems to bask in the moment, taking in a long breath. When he lets it out, he can't seem to stop himself from smiling. Oh yes, it's absolutely perfect. The conversation ends there, and the man goes back to devouring his buffet of food that he has at his table. He doesn't really look up and seems to savor each and every bite. It's almost aggressive as he tears through the burgers with his teeth, clearing his plate in just a matter of seconds. My grumbling stomach makes itself known again, and I suddenly can't really blame that man for scarfing through his meal. If he's a trucker, he probably hasn't stopped for a real meal in a while anyway. And for all I know, he's someone that really needs the food that he's attacking. Ted has retreated into the kitchen since he apparently works as both the waiter and the cook of the place. At that time of night, there probably weren't enough customers to warrant having two employees working. One person could manage the whole place if he knew how to cook a few of the menu items. I cycle through the jukebox while I wait for my meal, and finally Ted comes out with a plate, bringing it over to my table. The bacon cheeseburger and the fries don't look like anything special, but they will do. My stomach will definitely appreciate it. I can't help but notice the man in the corner sniffs the air a little once my plate is put down. Hopefully he doesn't try to add my food to his own buffet. I pick up the burger in my hands and can almost feel my stomach beckoning for it, waiting in anticipation. A figure crashes through the entranceway, falling down onto the floor in the middle of the diner. I leap up to my feet, dropping my burger back onto the plate. It is the pale young woman that left with her boyfriend just minutes ago. She was already looking rough before, but now she is covered in blood and shrieking. She's covered in glass from the door, but the cuts on her are too large to have been caused by that. No, she has deep, long bloody rips in her clothes and on her body, and she's bringing in a trail of blood behind her. She crawls for a moment, wincing and crying before rolling over onto her back. All that's coming out of her are heavy breaths and pained grunts. She's not forming any words. She's just laying there, staring up at the ceiling of the place and gasping for air. I want to help her, but I don't have the first clue of what to do. Finally, 
some logic clicks in and drowns out my rising panic. I turned to Ted who was just standing in stunned silence. Get an ambulance here! Immediately! Now! Right now! The old waiter stops stammering long enough to nod and hurries back behind the counter to the old phone hanging on the wall. I crouch over the girl and cradle her head in my hand, trying to get a better look at her injuries. It's bad. Really bad. The wounds stretch across wide parts of her body, and she is losing blood fast. She had to have been attacked by an animal, and it must have been a really big and vicious one to have done that to her. I look toward the door, half expecting to see her boyfriend follow, but he never does. What happened? She tries to speak, but she looks too scared and too hurt to even form words. Ted yells from behind the register. Phone line is dead. Without another thought, I pull my cell phone out from my back pocket and immediately dial 911. I put the phone to my ear and there is nothing on the other end of the call. There isn't even static. I try again and there is still nothing, nothing at all. I even try calling for my boss just to see if it's just something wrong with one specific number, but no calls are going through. I shake my head, desperately dialing for help again to no avail. What the hell is this? Why aren't any phones working? Cell phones don't work here, never have, the old man grumbles. Diner is sitting right in the middle of a dead zone. Well, that's just perfect, I say. Smart placement for this establishment, yeah? Ted shrugs, trying the landline again. We were here long before those cell towers went up. It doesn't explain why this phone isn't working though. It always works. From what I could tell, it apparently didn't always work. And that phone picked a really bad time to decide to not make calls. I look out the windows at the dimly lit parking lot outside. How far away do I need to get before it's clear of the dead zone? Ted finally gives up on the landline and walks over to me. He points toward the direction of the forest on the other side of the property. If you head all the way across the parking lot and a little bit into the clearing before the tree line, you might be able to start to get some service back. It's no guarantee, but sometimes people walk out that way when they need to be on their phone. I'd say this is one of those times when we definitely need to be. I turn back to the woman gasping on the floor. She is looking worse and worse with every passing moment. She was already very pale, but that reclusive, pasty sheen is now turning more ghostly than anything. It looks like her life is draining out of her. If she doesn't get medical attention soon, she'll bleed out from all of those wounds. All right, I say, summoning as much courage as I can. I'll head over there and try to get a signal, then I'll make the call. How far is the nearest hospital? About 12 miles north. That's further than I hoped, but I pushed that thought aside. With their sirens blaring, an ambulance would probably be able to get here much quicker than anyone else. Besides, having medics on the way is much better than not asking for their assistance. Even if they couldn't make it in time, at least I would have tried. I'll be right back, I say, shaking off some nervousness. Hang tight and try to keep pressure on some of the really bad wounds. Ted crouches down as best as he can and puts his hands over the towel he has on her stomach. You got it. The shabby bearded man in the corner booth is still sitting there eating. It's like he doesn't even notice what's going on in the diner or that he just simply does not care. Waiter, get over here. I'm almost done with my appetizer. Ted turns to the only remaining customer, his face growing red with anger. What's wrong with you? That young woman is hurt and we need to get her help. Nothing is going to help her, not tonight. I'm about to step out the door when I hear him. What do you mean by that? It's the monthly feast. I like to treat it as a three course meal. All of this has been a great appetizer, but the main course is nearly ready. Don't listen to him, I say, trying to get the focus back on the real problem. He's just some psycho that shouldn't be out this late. Psycho? <laughs> The bearded man lets out a loud, bellowing laugh before swallowing his own hysteria and growing very quiet. You only think that because you don't know any better. I ignore him. The ramblings of a man that is either drunk or crazy isn't something I need to be worried about. I need to save that woman before it's too late. 
and the only way to do that is to get across the parking lot so I can make that call. I push through the broken door and head outside. There are only a few light posts in the parking lot, and they barely illuminate anything. Thankfully, the full moon overhead offers a little bit of support, bathing the whole area in a bluish-gray glow. The parking lot is mostly empty. There's just a couple cars. Presumably, the one belonging to the waiter is parked at the back door, while the black one belonging to that couple is still where they left it. Strangely, there doesn't seem to be a car that would belong to that weird man in the corner booth. Maybe he is the driver of one of the other three trucks parked there, or maybe he walked to the diner. My rig is still sitting there, just as I left it along with the other trailer trucks nearby. One thing I love about being a truck driver is the sense of community and the collective efforts of people all doing similar jobs, all going through the same ordeals together. I always get a warm feeling when there are a few rigs parked close together, like they are huddling together for the evening. There's just something comforting about that. Those trucks have drivers that are resting inside, people that might be able to help. I could just take an extra few seconds to ask them for assistance. That wouldn't hurt anyone. I keep looking over my shoulder as I cross the lot. There is something out there that hurt that girl, and I would really prefer not to get hurt too. If I can make it back with some of those sleeping drivers to get some extra help, that would be fantastic. It could make all of the difference. The closest trailer truck is about 30 feet from my own rig, and I jog over to it as I get close, still keeping an eye out on my surroundings and anything that might try to come for me. The windshield and the side windows are covered by maps to help block out light and make it easier to sleep. It's a common trucker trick, and it's something I can't blame them for. It's hard enough trying to sleep in your rig without light beating down into your eyes. I go around to the driver's side door and stretch my arm up to knock on the shaded window. The door doesn't open, and I don't hear any movement from inside the cab. I decide to give it a few more tries. Still nothing. No one stirs inside of that truck, and that's when I notice it. The driver's side door is just slightly ajar, not fully closed. I slip my fingers into the opening and slowly pull the cab door open. A head slips out of the truck, followed by a torn up body as the whole corpse falls out of the driver's seat and onto me, knocking me to the pavement. It's obvious that the driver is dead, considering the enormous claw marks all over him and the blood that's still seeping from the wounds. Some of it gets onto me as I roll the man off of me and start to feel my whole body shudder. I've never seen a dead body anywhere besides a funeral, and I've never had one fall on top of me. It takes a moment to collect my breath and peel my gaze away from the dead man at my feet. I shift my attention up to the open truck and look inside the driver's cab. The steering wheel has been ripped off and fell by the pedals. The seats and dashboard are riddled with long rips matching the claw marks that are on the dead driver and the girl inside of the diner. If I had decided to stay in my truck instead of going into the diner, that could have been me. I would have been butchered in my cab just like that driver. The next closest truck isn't far, but I don't even need to get close to see the blood splattered on the windshield. Someone has gone out of their way to slaughter the sleeping truck drivers in the parking lot. I don't even check the third truck because I'm already sure of what's waiting for me there. I can't worry about that now, as awful as it is. It's too late for those drivers, but it might not be too late for that young woman. I take a moment to collect myself, trying to deal with the fact that men just like me are being killed by something. The strangest part was that the trucks don't seem to have been broken into. There are no smashed windows or dented hoods. That door was open, like something had opened it, but the inside looked like it had been destroyed by an animal, not a person. I take a breath, knowing I can't delay any longer. The whole parking lot is deathly quiet, but given that it's the middle of the night when most people are asleep, that wasn't strange. And with a few people dead in that parking lot, I shouldn't expect much noise anyway. Then I hear something. It's faint at first, but it cuts through the silence. I freeze. It sounds like it's coming from beneath the trailer. I slowly crane my head down toward the wheels, down toward the space where something could be waiting. Whatever attacked that girl, and probably her boyfriend too, and killed those drivers is out here with me. I brace myself for whatever is under the trailer. 
I get low enough to see, and there's nothing but empty space. There's nothing there. I realize that I have been holding my own breath for the past minute and finally let it out. Whatever noise that was must have been a trick of the imagination. There's just me and the howling wolves or coyotes in the distance. I turn toward the tree line at the far end of the lot and start making my way there. Hopefully, my phone will be able to get a signal by the time I get over there. Then I can make the call and we can finally get help. We need an ambulance to get that girl some help, some police to survey the property and figure out what's going on and whatever else we need. It's all just one phone call away. I reach the end of the paved lot and step onto the grass on the other side. Over my shoulder, the diner looks so far away, much further than it initially felt. But between me and that business, there are at least three dead truckers and whatever or whoever killed them. My gaze wanders up to the glowing moon overhead while I pull out my phone and start to punch in the numbers for 911. My phone still isn't getting a signal. Come on! There's still nothing. I proceed further into the forest, further away from the diner and hopefully closer to an area that will actually get cell phone service. Assistance is so close, practically within reach, and I stare at the phone as I walk through the woods waiting for the moment when I see bars on the screen and I can finally make my call. I'm paying too much attention to the phone and don't notice the root that catches my foot. It sends me falling hard onto my stomach, the phone slipping out of my hand. The wind is knocked out of me, but I do my best to rummage for my phone in the dirt and in the dark, finally wrapping my fingers around it. I climb back up to my feet, bringing the dirty phone up to my face and wiping off the screen. That's when I see the bars on the screen. A signal. I look up from my phone before I start dialing to find nothing but a bunch of bushes in front of me. It's not the bushes themselves that are concerning me though. It's the fact that the leaves and branches are swaying a little. And I can't help feeling that there is something within that shrubbery looking back at me. Whatever is growling is coming from near that plant. It's so hard to make out anything in the darkness of the forest. The glow of that full moon isn't casting enough of a light to really help either. Instead, it's just bathing the trees in an eerie glow. There is no mistaking it. There is some kind of animal in the darkness. Those bushes are pushed aside as something steps out from the darkness from behind the trees. It's hard to make out what it is. It's big and furry, walking on all fours, with triangular ears pointing up toward the moonlit sky. It's too big to be a coyote or a wolf. Its shape doesn't seem quite like a bear's either. Then it rises up, standing up on its hind legs. Its front paws are clawed hands reaching out toward me. I run. There is nothing else I can do. I hurry through the forest as quickly as my legs will carry me. I can hear it behind me, snarling and howling, breaking sticks as it sprints behind me. It's gaining on me. I can feel it. It's probably faster than me, probably faster than any human. It's going to rip me to shreds, just like it did to the other truckers. I won't end up avoiding their fate in the end. No, I'll just be dead on the ground instead of in my rig. I make it through the tree line and keep sprinting, not daring to actually look back. My feet find pavement again as I run across the parking lot toward the glowing sign of the diner. I'm even more relieved to see it than I was when I first pulled in. I know I'm still hungry, I have to be but my belly aches seem to have subsided and given in to the fear that is jolting through the rest of my body and making me run faster than I ever have before. That thing back there, whatever it was, was not a normal animal. It's something else. I keep my eyes transfixed on the door that I need to get through at the front of the diner, but there are things that seem to appear at the corners of my view. In my peripherals, I can see the trailer trucks to my sides, but there's things beneath the trailers, big, dark shapes, like enormous silhouettes with their horn-like ears. I can't bring myself to turn my head to get a better look. I don't want to. I throw myself through the entrance of the diner and slam the door behind me. Not that it will do much since the glass is shattered. Ted is waiting for me with the girl still on the floor. The bearded man is still in the corner, and against common sense, he is still eating at his table like nothing is happening. What happened? Ted asks, rushing over to me. Did you make the call? I look down in my hands and realize my cell phone isn't there. It must have fallen out of my grasp when I saw that thing in the woods, 
or fallen out during my frantic haste to get back. I pat my pockets just to be sure, but there is no sign of the one chance that we had to call for help. I shake my head. No, I managed to get a signal, but then... Then what? The old man asks, starting to grow frustrated. Then what, kid? Spit it out! I can't bring myself to tell him what I saw. It just sounds too crazy. Like speaking it aloud would make it so my mind really collapsed in on itself. All of the weirdness and unusual stress of the night has to be taking its toll on me, clawing away at my sanity. We need to call someone, Ted shouts. This woman is going to die on my floor. I told you, there's no point. The bearded man in the corner finally gets up, wiping his mouth with his sleeve before flipping over one of the plates as if to signify that he is done with his meal. There's nothing you can do to stop what's happening. It's the feast, and there's nothing quite like hunger that you haven't been able to satiate in a month. The man walks toward us. He is large, and his torn, muddy clothes tell me a story of someone that is going through a difficult life. He doesn't seem to mind, though. He is absolutely comfortable and content, acting like he is having a great time despite the dying woman in front of him. Before he gets to us, he crouches down over the young woman and reaches out. He touches her face with a dirty index finger, brushing it along one of the deep scratches on her cheek until his finger is red and then brings it to his lips, tasting the blood. Mmm, yes, absolutely delicious. This is going to be good. Ted suddenly pulls out a revolver from behind the register and aims the large pistol at the final customer. That's enough. I don't know what your problem is, mister, but you need to get out of this place right now. I immediately put my hands up and back away from the line of fire. What are you doing? You think that you can operate a restaurant at this hour and not have something stowed away just in case someone decides to get smart in the middle of the night? Ted asks, pulling back the hammer of the revolver. People think they can get away with anything at this hour. Sometimes you need some fire to get them straight. His gaze remains fixed on the stranger's face. Now I'm not going to tell you again. Get the hell out of here. A wicked grin appears from within the man's scraggly beard, and his eyes light up with excitement at the sight of the gun. He stares down the barrel with no fear at all. Instead, it seems like he's waiting for that bullet, like he wants it. There's no doubt in my mind that there is something seriously wrong with that man, and he quickly proves me right. Do it, he says, moving his jacket out of the way so that more of his torso is visible. Pull the trigger, old man. I want you to. Let's see what happens. The man takes a confident step toward the barrel of the gun, and Ted seems startled behind it. Most people aren't comfortable making any movements when someone is aiming a firearm at them, but that man doesn't seem phased in the slightest. The bearded man takes in a long inhale through his nose, like he's trying to sniff something out. I'm immediately reminded of those sounds I heard beneath the trailers those ravenous snuffles that startled me so badly. It's just like that. No, you don't have it in you, the man said. As much as I want to see some bloodlust, I can smell how frightened you are. You've worked so many shifts for so many years, haven't you? But we both know you've never seen anything like tonight. You hear that? My friends out there are famished. They've been looking forward to this night for weeks, and now we get to finally indulge. His friends? Wolves? I didn't even have a chance to ask for clarification because he kept going. That pretty lady right there will be one of my friends too if she stays alive a little longer. She's a fighter, that one. Look at her shoulder. Someone took a good bite out of her. Mmm, I can't wait for that. I'm ready to really sink my teeth into some real fresh meat. Don't worry, I'll leave a nice tip for you, old man. He takes another step forward, right into a beam of moonlight that is pouring in from the window. The energy in the room shifts and suddenly everything feels cold. My feet won't move, like my instincts are too scared to tell me to flee. It's how I felt when I was outside, when I was being chased by those creatures. The man's heavy breathing speeds up as his eyes grow wide with something that looks like utter excitement. The teeth filling that big grin sharpen and he suddenly collapses to his knees. 
His body winces and flails about suddenly. And then there are the sounds of bones breaking. He's grunting and starting to cry out in pain, but he looks happy about it. He's smiling through the apparent agony, laughing through it as his voice deepens before being swallowed up by more animalistic growls. What the hell is happening? Ted cries out over all of the terrible, disgusting sounds coming from the man on the floor. What's going on? I don't have a good answer for him. I instead focus on the injured woman, still barely breathing nearby. I rush over and slip my arms beneath hers, dragging her back toward the register and away from the wild man, who is only getting stranger by the second. His face elongates into a snout as his skin is torn away and sprouts fur in its place. His ears rise and sharpen as his body grows taller and wider. His clothes rip at the seams. I remember the silhouette of that thing in the forest and those furry arms that reached out from under the trucks. It's just the same. He's just like them. We thought that the threat was only outside, but one of them was inside all along. Shoot! I yell out. Now, shoot him! Ted manages to squeeze the trigger with his trembling hands. The first bullet sails over the man's head, destroying the jukebox behind him. The old man is panicking, and rightfully so, but he needs to get rid of that guy before things get worse. Hit him! I yell out, my voice cracking under the strain of everything. I'm trying! He squeezes again, twice in sequence. The two bullets manage to find their target, striking the man a couple times in the chest as he's still growling and groaning from the transformation happening to his body. He doesn't seem to even notice that he's shot and those holes in him start to fade away, mending themselves like they were never there at all. What is he? Ted shrieks, frantically squeezing the gun again. His bullets hit, but it only gets us the same result. That thing isn't hurt at all. I look up from the thing writhing and changing in front of us to find silhouettes in the diner windows, tall hairy beasts. It's the same creatures I saw before, the friends that the man mentioned, and the things that the bearded man is clearly one of. The diner really is surrounded, and they're closing in. There is no escape. The only thing we can do is to try to barricade ourselves back in the diner. The building doesn't offer much protection, but hopefully it will be enough until those things get bored or leave to find some other victims. What are we supposed to do? The old man asks, his face flush and trembling in fear. What is going on? He clicks the trigger of the revolver a few times and the cylinder spins, but there are no bullets left in the chamber. He doesn't seem to notice, desperately trying to keep shooting. We're going to be all right, I tell him. I say this mostly to try to calm my own nerves. We just need to hole up somewhere they can't get into and wait them out until they're gone. What's the kitchen like in here? Is there only one way in? There's two, that door in the front, and there's a back door too. We can work with that. My mind is racing. I don't even want to look at the monster that's starting to rise in the middle of the restaurant as I drag the bleeding girl into the kitchen and Ted follows close behind. He pulls one of the large shelves in front of the door to act as a barricade while I make sure the back door is locked. I push whatever I can in front of it. I stumble away from the back door. One of those things is already at the back trying to get in what are they? Ted gasps, waving around his empty gun as if he can actually use it, like he needs it to stay sane. I don't have a good answer, but I give it my best guess. Full moon tonight, people turning into hairy monsters. There's an obvious answer, but it can't actually be real. It shouldn't be. It's the only thing that makes sense. After all, we both saw it with our own eyes. And if this is anything like the movies, we just need to wait for morning when the moon goes down. Then we'll be all right. It's like what that guy was talking about. This is their big night, and they want to make the most of it. We just can't give them what they want. I look at the clock hanging overhead. There's still a few hours left until sunrise. I just don't know if we'll be able to last that long. You don't happen to have more ammunition for that gun of yours, do you? No, the old man says with a shake of his head looking into the empty chamber of the revolver with a great deal of sadness. Never would have thought that I would have to use all the bullets. Hell, I've never had to fire the damn thing. Usually, just pointing the gun at someone is enough to protect the diner if need be. Usually. It wasn't exactly a usual situation, and they weren't exactly usual customers. 
Every light in the diner suddenly went dark. They cut the power, I say, swearing under my breath. They're making sure we don't have anything. Dad nods and looks absolutely defeated. I can't blame him. We're backed into a corner with no way of getting out, with those things at both of the exits. The only light coming into the kitchen is the moonlight coming down through the skylight on the ceiling, giving us just enough illumination to see everything around us. Can I ask you something? The old man says. How was the food? I didn't even have a chance to eat. That was the unfortunate, honest truth. My bacon cheeseburger was still probably sitting on that plate waiting for me. I was about to take my first bite when this girl came back all bloody. Yes, we really need to get her something soon or... Ted stares at the young woman on the floor. A sinking feeling moves through me and I expect to find her dead when I follow his gaze, but instead I find something else entirely. The woman's wounds are gone. The blood still stains her clothes, but the tears and rips that were all over her, that were slowly killing her, were no longer there. She even starts moving more than she has since she first crashed through the diner door. It starts with her breathing becoming louder and heavier, and then her nose starts sniffing the air. There's only one wound still open on her body, the bite mark on her shoulder. I think back to what the man said about that bite, and how she would be one of his friends soon if she kept living. I'm barely processing what I'm seeing as my mind is trying to find some explanation. That's when she opens her mouth and something inhuman and terrible comes out. She begins to change, just like that man did. Her body twists and contorts and breaks itself apart to make way for something monstrous. We back away, but there is nowhere we can go. The doors are knocked open and the other creatures creep into the room, walking on their hind legs in such an unnatural way. Their toothy snouts drip with drool and their narrow, primal gazes look at us hungrily. That girl that had been a victim now looks unrecognizable and joins the pack of beasts that surround us. We're backed against the oven with nowhere to go. Look, I don't know what this is. Ted starts, his hands out in surrender. I don't. One of them suddenly pounces and brings its jaws and claws down onto the old man in his own kitchen. I can't bear to look, but I hear him being eaten and ripped apart. I see one last hope in a meat cleaver to my left, but the moment I start to reach for it, the whole group of monsters comes for me. I'm pinned to the top of the stove by those furry, snarling creatures. Their maws snap and sneer at me as they all start tearing into my flesh. I'm right where they want me to be, right at the place where all meals are prepared. I can feel my body start to become food. I just look up at the moon through the skylight. It's all I can do as I become a meal. My stomach isn't growling or grumbling anymore. Instead, it's being used to fill someone else's belly. I should have kept my foot on the pedal and kept driving right past that diner. The only people at diners in the middle of the night are people you want to stay clear of. I should have listened to Lenny. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.